see the Quinnai Nation artwork in the background there. Uh, these are some books that my students try and raid whenever they're in my office. Uh, for my favorite pen professor, oh, I know who this is. How are you? <laughs> What's going on out that way? Let's we'll see what else we have on the desk here. You guys can see pictures of my kids. All right. That's, uh, wait, let me make sure I show you a picture of my wife so she won't think that we didn't give her enough air time. <laughs> All right. Tell me the state of HBCUs and the social media age. That's an interesting question. I would tell you, you should be reading about the state of HBCUs in the social media age because we all now have the ability to directly communicate with our followers and with our students and with our alums. So frankly, the state of HBCUs should be more effective, more engaging. Um, we love social media because that gives us the form to tell our story directly. And you know, there's this great African parable that says, until the, um, how's it go? It goes, until the lion tells his tale, the story of the hunt will always favor the hunter. So if you aren't getting your message out there, that's their, your own fault. You've been debating about coming here. You're debating about coming to Paul Quinn? I see you, Candace Quarles. By the way, my favorite DeSoto candidate for the city council out there, Candace Quarles, has joined us. If you guys can't vote for her, make sure you donate money to her. All right? That's important. Much love for what she's doing and what she's going to do. Uh, HBU. You thought I said HBU. No, not HBU. You think about going to HBU J977? You should come to Fall Point College, but we'll talk about that later. All right, what else would you guys like to know? You would love Periscope. Ask the followers to share with their followers. Okay. I love Periscope. This is the first time I've used it, uh, but this is fun. I think this is going to become a regular tool of the Quinai Nation. Uh, we we will be we'll be nation building on Periscope soon. How do we stand out in the Dallas marketplace? Uh, that's a great question. You know, quite honestly, we're not trying to stand out in the Dallas marketplace. We're trying to stand out in the national landscape. Um, one of the goals that I set when I became president, which the board bought into, was we want to become one of America's great small colleges. Uh, and to do that, we had to distinguish ourselves and identify a competitive advantage in the national landscape. We think that our new urban college model provides us that opportunity to do so. We're the first urban work college, um, you know, we're the first urban work college in the country. Uh, it just so happens that we're an HBCU that's doing that. But our, our goal is to be an institution that attracts students from all over the country. Uh, right now, over 40% of our students come from across the country, and it's exciting. I mean, we have students from Oakland, L.A., Minneapolis, St. Paul, Chicago, Detroit, D.C., uh, New York. I mean, we're creating a national institution, so we stand out nationally by having a value proposition that commands attention and by doing thing quite, things, quite frankly, that others aren't doing. Um, so that might be the recipe for standing out in Dallas, but... We're a little more ambitious than that. All right, so let's jump into it. Stay, we're gonna stay there. Okay. We're gonna go to this camera here. Okay, camera uh, two. Camera two. We've got angles. all kind of angles we've coming at angles. it. So the value proposition that, that you just spoke about, uh, speak on the urban village model that you you know you, you created when sure. you first came into office. Sure. So we are. Um, uh, big Texas place. Every time he sees the Memphis Grizzlies, he thinks about me. Yeah, every time I see them play and look at my bank account, I think about them too. <laughs> right? Um, no, we what we've decided to do. Our, our primary goal. Hey, I love Quinnite Calvin Green. I see you. Good to see you, brother. Um, 
What we're trying to do, the, the singular mission for our institution, we want to end urban poverty. Wait, should I be looking at that camera? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I'm new at this, okay? Uh, we want to end urban poverty. That, okay. Want, okay. Um, so our goal is to end urban poverty. We want to do that using students who come from these under-resourced environments. I tell my students all the time, someone is going to figure out how to end poverty and how to end urban poverty. And they're going to become very wealthy doing it. Why shouldn't it be the people who come from urban poverty, who come from these neighborhoods, right? We want them to become entrepreneurial. The issue is no one has ever taken the time to talk to them this way. No one has ever taken the time to encourage them to dream bigger dreams. One of the things that I think is very interesting, whenever people talk about the relevancy of HBCUs, right, which I, I never engage in that conversation because I think it's a stupid question, right? But I think the bigger issue is that we haven't been ambitious enough, right? What we should have been doing and been unapologetic about doing is addressing the needs of our communities, right? So if we know that rampant single mothers is increasing the chances of children being raised in poverty, then we should have been talking about that, right? We should have been afraid to address that. If we know drug abuse is a problem, then we should have dealt with that. For us, you know, we have something called, you can see it on the board, it's the access triangle. We made up our own version of an economic development model, right? And we think that you can solve for any economic issue, any community development issue, by addressing the access points that are most critical to those communities. Our first access point was the access to food. We're in a food desert. We're closer to a garbage dump than we are a grocery store. It's ridiculous, right? So we had a choice. We could sit there and be like, oh, we're just so pitiful. We hope we can do something. Or we could stand up and say, you know what? We have value. We have things we can do for ourselves. We will re-examine. We will explore our situation differently. So that's why we wound up turning the football field into a farm. Right? It's why we fought back when the city wanted to turn the garbage dump into the super garbage dump of the Southwest. It's why we tackled this issue of affordability and student loans. I think it's ridiculous that we tell people from under-resourced communities and from backgrounds which are defined by poverty that your way out of poverty is debt. Right? So we're going to load you up with massive amounts of debt, but that's going to be okay because you're going to make money after it. By the time you're 50, you've paid off the loans. Why don't we just create an economic structure where the debt is as minimal as possible? And if that means that you have to have a candid conversation with the students and say, you're not going to have a climbing wall. There's some things we can't afford, but we're going to do this because what we're trying to do is give you a better life. And if that works for you, then we're your school. If it doesn't work for you, there are plenty of other places for you to go to to have a live band and you graduate with $40,000 in debt. We wish you the best. You can get a job at the businesses that our students create. All right, that's how we look at it. Awesome. So again, we're here. The Tom Joyner Foundation is interviewing uh, the president of Paul Quinn, Mike Sorrell. Uh, and we're going to talk and continue to have these conversations and, and these questions um, as it continues on. Um, and going back to the students, um, what are some of the leadership qualities that uh, they're going to be getting from Paul Quinn? What, What's going to draw them in here, and then when they leave, they say, okay, I've learned these type of leadership qualities. Sure, here. sure. So we demand our students leave from day one. All right? I mean, our institutional ethos is we over me. The needs of the community supersede the wants of the individual. Our guiding principles are four L's of Quinite leadership. Leave places better than you found them. Live a life that matters. Lead from wherever you are, and love something greater than yourself. These are leadership principles. What we're saying to folks is, you don't wait for someone to anoint you to be a leader. You lead from day one. We challenge our students, you want some social activities? That's on you, right? I don't think that you want my staff to pick all your social activities, right? If you do, you're lame, right? Let's just call it what it is. You should have the ability to articulate what it is that interests you. So we start holding the students accountable. Now, sometimes it's a little bit of a rough adjustment, right? Because if you've been down your whole life and everybody has just handed you stuff and we're saying we're not going to hand you things, we're going to give you a platform for you developing your voice, some students struggle with that. But the ones who embrace it flourish. We have a soccer program. People always crack me up. They're like, oh, you created a soccer program, so 
you could get Hispanic students to enroll. Well, first of all, how insulting is it that you have a specialty recruiting program, right? Like, that's why the black students at predominantly white schools are mad right now, because they are recruited to be the diversity on the campus, right? That's a bad fit. You recruit people because they identify with your mission. But our soccer program came because students came and said, we want to have a soccer program. They gave me a proposal. I helped them fund it. I helped raise money for them. Then I went to their, when they were a club team, I went to their games. I was their biggest cheerleader. Then when it looked like that they could do it, I made one of them the head coach. Right? That's how we wound up with a soccer program. It wasn't some nefarious plan. Right? It was just we're pushing them to lead. That's how we do it here. You want to do something cool, go do it. Okay. Um, paradigm that we will outlive you. Oh, I said the paradigm will outlive you. Oh. Awesome. Um, so let's jump into some of the current news that just happened. Uh, the new $20 bill is changing over. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Listen, I, I've read some of the folks that are excited. I've read some of the criticism. All right. One of the criticisms that I thought was just fascinating was people didn't like the picture of Harry Tubman that they selected, right? Now, let's be honest. I mean, I never looked at Harry Tubman and thought, whew. <laughs> right? She wasn't in the best of times. I mean, yeah. right? Like, right. I mean, she didn't have the benefit of beauty parlors. Right. She didn't have the benefit. Like, she was a warrior, right? right? Like, why are we expecting her to look like anything other than what she was? Right? That's not why she's significant. My point is this. We have been underrepresented for a long time. I mean, I think it'd be more impactful if we all got our 40 acres and a mule that we had been promised, because then we would have had an opportunity for wealth. But I think that anything you can do that begins to give our students and our people a sense of pride and ownership is incredibly significant. So how dare anyone take issue with the fact that she's on the $20 bill? I'm gonna celebrate that she's on the $20 bill, and I am not so shallow that I'm gonna take issue with the fact that she wasn't made up and beautified. She didn't live in a made up and beautified time, right? I mean, maybe some of those people should try walking the Underground Railroad. Or better, maybe, better yet, maybe they should do something significant so history will remember them. I take great pride in the fact that this sister is, and that's the other thing that I think is interesting, right? I'm not sure some of that criticism isn't wrapped up in some sexist BS, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I don't really understand that because you know what? I grew up in a house with a strong black woman, right? I mean, I had my parents, both parents, I had my grandparents, but my mother was strong, my grandmother was strong. They told me, don't you dare bring a weak woman into this house as your wife, right? I have a strong wife. My expectation is my little girl will be strong, right? So I want them to see Harriet Tubman. I want them to rejoice in Harriet Tubman. And I'm going to teach them the lessons of Harriet Tubman, not the looks of Harriet Tubman. That's how I look at it. You, uh, and you mentioned your wife and your daughter. Um, She's a graduate of Spelman. She is. And so is, are you prepping your daughter for HBCU life? And uh, I mean, there, like, there's no, I mean, why are you gonna act like Spelman <laughs> women give their daughters any choices, right? The, the, the poster says, let her first steps be towards Spelman. Oh, wow. my, my wife was very clear when, you know, first of all, my wife was heartbroken when she found out we were having a boy first, mm -hmm. right? Cause she grew up with a sister her mother was one of nine sisters, right? So they just had all women running around, right? And so my my wife's sister went to Spelman. Like my daughter's going to Spelman. And you know what? Good, right? Like it is a phenomenal institution for black women. And I believe in legacies, right? And I think it would be an amazing legacy for my daughter to follow her mother to Spelman pledge aka at Spelman just like her mother did and then if she wants to go turn around and go to Wharton for business school just like her mother did I like I'm calling all that a win oh, right awesome. um it's playoff season and I saw someone mention the Grizzlies so is, is that your team well you know I was part of a group that was trying to buy the Grizzlies before okay. I became president of Paul Quinn okay right? so I was on path to be the president of the Grizzlies, so that's why they brought up the Grizzlies. 
Um, I grew up in Chicago, right? We don't turn in our teams. That's just not how we roll, right? Like Bears, Blackhawks, Bulls, and I'm South Side, so White Sox, right? You know, I went to Wrigley Field one time, got lost. I was eight when my dad came to pick me up. He said, ask me, what did I learn? I was like, have a quarter, call mom, right? Like, I'm thinking all this stuff. He's like, no, we are White Sox fans. We don't come to Wrigley Field. Right. And I was like, thanks, Dad, right? Um, no, I love basketball. I'm a college basketball player. Okay. I, you know, we, we're big supporters of the Mavericks here. Okay. But, you know, like I've been a Steph Curry fan oh, from the days of Davidson, right? I remember his dad, because his dad, I have an appreciation of people with exquisite shots. And his father was an exquisite shooter. And, you know, how do we not love Steph Curry, right? Like, for all reasons, right? I mean, this is a brother who is doing it the right way, representing us the right way. Beautiful wife and family puts them on the forefront, puts them for, like, that's a very public display of love. In a time, like, where we have a shortage of that, if you aren't checking for Steph Curry, I question your judgment. I agree with that. <laughs> you talked about uh, the college basketball where you played in the past. Uh, what was one of your fondest memories uh, from you? Oh man, listen, I I was a shooter. I got to score a lot, so yeah. I loved. Um, one of my fondest memories, um, my first basket in college was a dunk. Um, I scored 38 on Emory, my best friend's school, so that was fun. Um, you know what? I just love competing. Right? Like, I love the game. Uh, I love everything about it. I love working out. I love, I just love it. So, I just, I honor it, right? Like, it makes me angry when I see people not show it with the same respect. Uh, switching back to some, some current news, um, last week we did a press release, I'm not a press release, um, press conference. Press conference with the uh, Tom Jones Foundation. Yeah. We were talking about our new program with you guys and the partnership. Yeah, that's going to be hot. Uh, so, yeah, yeah tell me, tell me how, how you see it. Oh, uh, so really what we're doing is we're addressing the shortage of STEM teachers in DISD. And, you know, we have this incredible financial model. So you can attend Paul Quinn College. Total cost of attendance, you live on campus, is $14,300. That's it. Okay. And if you're on Pell Grant, $5,800 comes from the Pell. $5,000 is from the work program, which you just basically earned. So that's $10,800. But just when you step on campus, all right, then every average student picks up another $1,200 in either state funds or additional federal funds or whatever, right? So really, the average student is down to $2,300 of borrowed money a year. So when you start there, you're creating the possibility of a significant number of careers because you're taking financial disadvantages out of the equation. So what we've done here by partnering with the foundation is we can say to people who want to teach and want to be urban teachers, right? teach students from these communities, you're going to have your tuition paid, you're going to have the rest of what you're doing reduced to the point of almost nothing, and you have a job. So, so I mean, really, let's think about this now. You're going to go to school for free, right? You have a job waiting on you on the other side. You've got the platform of the Tom Joyner Foundation and Tom Joyner to help tell your story. And you're part of the Quinine Nation. And you never know what ridiculous thing we're going to do next. Right? So you're guaranteed to command more attention that way as well. And you're going to get to teach our kids. What part of this is not amazing? Right? So, I, man, we are fired up. We are fired up. And then, you know, we now are an institution that has a habit of sending students to the Teach for America Corps program. We have a relationship with um, St. Paul School District where if people want to go teach the group that's not going to be in DISD, the other people in the ed program, if you want to go teach in St. Paul, Minnesota, 
you have a job up there and the University of Minnesota will take you to graduate school and you don't have to pay. I mean, I, I just I don't laugh. So, <laughs> you know, again, I believe in free enterprise and freedom. You want to go borrow a bunch of money, be in debt, wonder whether or not you're going to have a job, but you know what? You got a live band at the football games. Yeah, good luck to you. You're not our kid anyway. Um, as, as the need for engineering and math and science um, in the career field, how do you think that this, the kids are going to start approaching that for higher education? You'll, you'll see more, do you think you'll see more students going into those, those majors? STEM fields? Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm not part of the great STEM hype. You know, quite honestly, um, I think it's wonderful, but I look at the math and science scores and preparation that our students have. You know, and I'm, I'm a little bit different college president. I read the application. Right? Like my staff shares them with me. I know what the math and science scores are. And what I would rather do is teach my students to have an appreciation and an understanding of the STEM fields from the business side. Right? So they are the business owners. They're the folks that run the businesses with a technical appreciation. You know, we are developing an engineering management degree. Right? Now, you get enough engineering so that you feel comfortable, but you're also not spending six years in college because you came to us needing to be remediated in math. So before we could get you to calculus, you needed two years of foundational math. So now it's a six year degree program. We're saying, why don't we give you the foundations of your STEM program, but we play to your strengths and we teach you about marketing, we teach you about finance, we teach you about management, and that's your role in the STEM field. So I love, I mean, I'm supportive of STEM. I think it's fine. I just don't see it as a great gold rush, right? I think there's some other ways to get into the great gold rush and that instead of constantly harping on what people don't do well, why don't we focus on what they do do well? Um, a couple more questions. Uh, if you had, if you were not the president here at Carl Quinn, what would you be on? What would be the career choice for you? Other than the Grizzlies. Yeah. Uh, you know, I wasn't owner and running an NBA franchise. Um, you know what? I have been so immersed in this for nine years. Like, I don't even have, I mean, as ridiculous as this may seem, like, I don't think that way. Like, I, yeah. Um, so if I had to, I mean, I know I'd be running something, right? Um, I don't know what it would be. Uh, as a member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, um, how have you influenced the, the, the members here of the Lambda Lambda chapter? Sure. So, um, you know, Lambda Lambda was suspended for a decade before I got here, right? Um, and we've got a wonderful brother, Maurice West, here, who worked tirelessly. He's a Paul Quinn alum, Lambda Lambda member. Um, he really, you know, the, the combination of having him doing all this incredible hard work and then being able to point to the fact that the president of the college is a Kappa and so there wouldn't be any foolishness that brothers would have to worry about. I think that helped. But the the message that I try and convey to the young brothers here is you have to be historic. Right? I'm always amazed I you know listen, everybody's competitive. So, you know, the alphas you have to concede the fact that historically they've done an extraordinary job. Um, the Omegas, for a long, long time, really did an extraordinary job. So, my point was, there's still room on the wall, right? Like, I mean, our brothers have done extraordinary things as well, but we weren't in the place where you saw, like, we weren't on the East Coast, we were in the Midwest. So, it was a different kind of person, and we're less of them. Um, but what I tell the brothers all the time, so first of all, the expectation is you lead, right? period. And you lead in a very significant way. I don't want to hear that you were a campus leader. I expect you.
to be a campus here. Frankly, I don't know how you're going to ever get to be a member here and you not be a campus leader. My vision for you is much grander, okay? This is about getting into the very best graduate and professional schools. This is about having the very best job opportunity. Because if you're going to wear my letters, then I expect you to eclipse whatever it is that I do in my career. Right? Like I'm not one of those people that you know looks at folks and say, you'll never be better than I am. I'm like, you better be better than I am. Right? Because then what the hell am I making all these sacrifices for? Right? The expectation is each generation eclipses the one that's previous to it, right? However, my job is to make it really raising, or to make it hard by raising the bar, okay? So I expect you to eclipse me, but I expect you to have to work to do it, right? Because iron sharpens iron, right? So I, I tell them all the time, better be great. Um, you know, I, I had an interesting experience. So I was part of the first line of brothers at Overland College. And then the Duke brothers had gone away when I got down there, so I was part of bringing them back. And those chapters really, the blueprint that we used is a blueprint we're using now here, right? Which is identify the, sp the smartest brothers, right? The smartest cool brothers, right? Because we still got <laughs> our thing to maintain, right? Um, and then we're going to push them, right? Then we're going to open up doors that allow them to see what life can be. And that's different. Like, it's a, it's a very, you know, it's just a different model, right? Like, it's a model that leads to a different place. And I'm not running, nobody's running around here talking about I'm arrogant, I'm conceited. Like, what the heck, what? I, like, we're running around here talking about what we do, right? We're confident in that we have the capacity to do great things. My expectation is they do great. Uh, what's a quote to live by? Um, so, right. I know you have many. Yeah. Um, All right, we'll take two. So, <laughs> you know, the whole we over me and the four L's, like, I created those. Okay. Right? So, those, um, I think uh, I love this quote from um, uh, from Homer's Iliad uh, to be both a doer of deed, speaker of words, and a doer of deed. Right? So, um, I use that one a lot. Um, if you hadn't asked me, I could tell you, right? Uh, but let's just go with those. Okay. And then uh, one of your favorite books? Oh, my other one is Power Concedes Nothing Without Demand. Never has, never will. My face is up. Just reminds me you have to fight every day. Uh, favorite books? Favorite book? Uh, so Art of War, my son Drew. Uh, okay. I'm going to give you a couple of uh, Alchemists by Pablo. Biography of Malcolm X. Um, what else do I really love? Um, well, I'll go with those three right now. And uh, this is our last question. Again, uh, we're enjoying this time to speak with you. Uh, and, you know, being the first president we do the Periscope with, uh, you, you set the bar high. Uh, but as the, the longest standing president here at Paul Quinn, how does that make you? What's your vision for Paul Quinn in these next 10 years or for the next 10 years? Sure. Well, I, so I won't be the longest serving until I get to 11 years. Okay. Right? I'm at nine. Um, my vision is that we become one of America's great small colleges. I mean, that, that's always been the vision. That's the standard. Like, that's what we're doing this for. Um, we created a new model of higher education. Uh, we've done things that are just, you know, people are always surprised by. You know, I always laugh because to be quite candid with you, like we're just warming up. Right? Like, I haven't taken the best stuff off the shelf yet. Right? Like, we have to develop the capacity to do the best stuff. So we're getting there. Um, we are, my expectation is that we will be one of America's great colleges. My expectation is that this period of time will be written about because as I told folks when I came in, there is no example in higher education of a school that went from being one of the worst in the country to one of the best, right? And I'm not knocking any of my alums who, like I love them, they're extraordinary people, but the facts are the facts, right? Like, you know, I believe in something called the Stockdale Paradox. 
I am relentlessly optimistic and have tremendous faith in the success of my mission. But I am always brutally honest about where I was and where I came from, right? Um, we were not a good institution. We had a lot of work to do. Uh, but we're doing that, and we're seeing it transform. And look, we get more media attention than any small school in the country. I mean, this week we were on HBO's Real Sports, right, with Brian Gumbel. I mean, you know, we just filmed a special with the PBS News Hour. Um, we had Kiki Palmer was here. You know, I mean, like the stuff we're doing is unprecedented, right? Because we're not just a one-trick pony. Like some folks wanted to write us off with the farm. You know, I laughed. I was like. Please, the farm is the easiest thing we got going. Wait till you see what's coming next. And I'm telling you right now, the next thing that I'm working on right now that we're about to announce, can't announce it because we haven't signed everything yet, like, that is a whole different level. I mean, literally, we are just warming up. So that, well, thank you guys very much for the opportunity. I've enjoyed my time on Periscope. Uh, anyone out there who wants to follow me on Twitter, it's easy, just at Michael Sorrell. My Facebook is easy too, Michael J. Sorrell. Um, Instagram, Michael Sorrell, like, I keep it simple, okay? Um, but you're always welcome if you send me a message. I work really hard to respond, answer your questions. You might not always like the answer you get, but you will always get an honest answer. So, come join the Quinine Nation. If you've got a brother, sister, some kids, anybody, Happy to have a shot at educating them if they want to be taught how to be leaders. And thank you, Tom Jordan Foundation, for the opportunity.